responsible for the protection of wildlife in Ireland. Um, we're in a government department, we're probably very badly funded compared with the Department of Agriculture. So our role is to protect badgers and the Department of Agriculture's role is to protect cattle. So as you can imagine, that often means that we're at loggerheads with one another. So the project that I'm going to talk about tonight really was where a vet from the Department of Agriculture and myself got together to work together um, looking at the badgers, which will be explained in the talks, but also we used some of the money, quite a lot of it actually, that the Department of Agriculture had for the badger cull and for TB eradication and they, they very kindly gave it to us to use for the project because my organisation was only able to contribute a small amount of money um, but a lot of staff time. <laughs> So thank you so much for inviting me tonight. I'm really glad to be here. Um, and as Vanessa said, please turn up your, your volume to hear the talks. Um, I, I just apologize that I can't talk to you live, but hopefully the internet will stay working for the questions. So Vanessa, whenever you're ready, thank you. So who are we? Well, the project was begun by Theresa McWhite, this lady here, and myself. Theresa's job is a vet with the Department of Agriculture. So she's responsible for the control of disease in farm animals. Mine is to protect wildlife. So obviously badgers were the common denominator and an overlap between our jobs. When we came up with the idea for this project, we built a team around us and we got major funding from ERAD, which is the government body responsible for the elimination of TB in Ireland. And we teamed up then with Trinity College in Dublin to keep us on the straight research path. So we became Team Badger and we're still in daily contact with one another, despite the project technically being over at this stage. Where are we? Well, Wicklow is this area here marked with the circle and our project involved the major route here called the M11, which goes down to Ross Lair and our connection with Britain and with Europe. The, as you can see from this, Wicklow is more or less straight across from Snowdonia and the habitat and the landscape is pretty similar in places. The reason we began this research was a newspaper article about farmers who believed that when a new motorway or a new road was put in through their farms, that their TB rates shot up. This has since been disproved in the particular areas that the farmers were concerned about. But we had this opportunity in Wicklow where a new road was being built and Teresa had already done unpublished research showing that the deer, the cattle and the badgers in the, this area of Wicklow had the same strain of TB. So we were asking would the roadworks impact on the badgers, on how they lived and on the TB levels and we saw this as an opportunity that was too good to be missed. The N11 road project itself was a major upgrade and realignment of this national route to try and bring it up to motorway standard. So you can see here in the top picture this series of bends and there were many serious and fatal accidents that happened there. So the new road replaced that road in places and in other places it ran alongside of it. We studied the normal um, territorial behaviour and, and the range of our badgers. So they were from 12 different social groups before, during and after the road. So this is all from the same place, these photographs. So we had three years before the road was built. We had 18 months during the actual construction and then we followed up the badgers for two years after that. And we're still writing up the final bits and pieces. So the field work took place between 2010 and 2017. So this picture really is to just show you what the landscape is like. It's 
rolling hills that um, are at the foothills of the Wicklow Mountains and they're kind of in a strip between those mountains and the sea. And the, the farms are really a mixture of pasture and tillage. So we sheep, we cattle farms, we had stud farms in the area. And very often the tops of the hills are wooded. So the arrow in the picture shows you woodland that uh, we'll come back to later in the talk. Over that period of field work, we captured about 140 badgers and over 80 of those uh, received GPS collars. So we normally caught them in cages and we gave them an anaesthetic then with using a pole syringe so that uh, we didn't have to get up close and personal while they were still awake. Each badger was weighed. Their neck and their groin area were shaved so that we could take TB uh, blood samples and uh, later on for the tattoo in the groin. So we took bloods for the TB and we took a pharyngeal swab as well. So the blood showed if the badger had TB and the swab showed if the badger was breathing out the TB bacillus. Each badger was microchipped so that we knew them individually and the four last digits of that microchip were tattooed onto the badger. So again, at a glance, they could be recognised and we knew which individual they were. Each of our badgers was vaccinated and this was something that was very popular with the farmers. So they were given the BCG and they got a full dose of that uh, vaccine. We took an ear punch for DNA because one of the things we were doing was trying to match up individuals with their parents or their offspring. And then, as I said, over 80 badgers received a GPS collar during that time. Some of them wore them for only a few months, other badgers wore their collar for several years. Once we were finished with the badger, they were put into what we called a recovery box. And this little red mark on the badger's forehead is some sheep spray so that we know which badgers had uh, ha had been uh, processed by us. If we caught them again the next day, we didn't need to knock them out. Those boxes were brilliant. As you can see from other pictures, they, uh, they were our operating table. And we used to put them right at the entrance to the set so that when the badger woke up, all he had to do was stagger out of the box and down the hole. It meant that we had no dozy badgers walking out onto roads or anything like that. If we caught a badger the next day or, or in succeeding uh, days of the, the field work and it had red paint on it, we just scanned it to read its microchip and then we opened the cage and let it off. So these are the type of records that we kept of the badgers. Um, and we kept a photographic record as well. And that enabled us to see that the project and the colours in particular hadn't any negative effect on our badgers. So over the years, the form developed this little box called Enda's Notes, which was for all the weird and wonderful things that I used to want to record. So you can see there that Millie's uh, record says that the ends of her canines were clipped, chipped, and that she had two upper incisors missing. And it says that she had spectacularly fractured canines, which obviously was me writing down a direct quote from a vet. So that photograph then is of Millie's teeth and her teeth, along with her general condition, would have helped us age her. So she was an old badger, we reckoned between five and eight years old. And over subsequent captures, we would have put her definitely at eight. These are the colours that we used. Um, they're TELUS collars from Follow It in Sweden and they weighed about just under 250 grams. So they look very bulky, but they swung around well on the badger's necks and they were able to lie down and to jump and run very easily with, with the collars on. Because of the weight of the collar, we insisted that they weren't put on any badger under eight kilograms. Now, there were many times we really wanted to put them on badgers that weighed less than that but we stuck to our guns. We wanted it to be less than 5% of the badger's weight. We programmed the collars then for four records a night, except in the spring and in September when we got eight records a night. Mm -hmm. And that helped us figure out where the badgers were. I'll come back to that shortly. They were expensive. 
So we were really lucky that ERAD sponsored the project and bought us quite a lot of these collars. And then the National Parks and Wildlife Service that I work with uh, funded all the text messages that the Badgers sent us every night, which actually added up to quite a lot of money as well. The collars worked pretty well, but they probably would work even better on, bad, on animals that didn't go down burrows um, and spend a lot of time digging because um, you know, they got knocked about quite a lot from that, but they were very robust and we were quite pleased with them. So this then is the type of information that we got from the colours. And this picture was created a very short uh, length of time, perhaps a month after starting into the project. So you can see each um, colour and shape belongs to an individual badger. And it gives us very discrete home ranges for the badgers. But you can also see that there are quite tight boundaries uh, between the different home ranges of these badgers. And generally speaking, home range like this would also be um, the territory of that social group. So you can see here in this yellow one, there's a few colours underneath um, that match up. So we had these tight boundaries between the groups, but there would be a certain amount of overlap. You can see a few green ones appearing there in this blue area and so on. There was a difference in the winter and the summer ranges of the badgers. There were certain differences between male and female ranges. But we found actually on day two of the project that these were much more um, accurate than doing bait marking. So prior for a year prior to starting the project, we had done some bait marking in the area. And what we had down often as two separate social groups, in fact, was one separate social group with two badgers using different parts of it um, during bait marking. But once they had their collars on, you could see that they used the whole area. So it helped us define our social groups. It also helped us find sets so if there was an area where we weren't sure where the set was, we would just look at the first records from every night and see was there a pattern there. And then we'd head off and start rooting around in the hedges until we found the sets. So the road was supposed to begin uh, construction within six months of us beginning the project. But in, in fact, it actually took three years to get going. So that gave us a plenty of time to start looking at the data that we had collected and to use that to look at the general ecology of these badgers rather than just at road related issues. So this is a list of topics that we covered either in published work or in work that we're still struggling to write up. So I'm going to speak uh, in, in this talk about the effectiveness of the forest guidelines and then I give you a little overview of the total project results at the end of the talk. So one of the areas that I was particularly interested in was the behaviour of breeding female badgers. And I began looking at that to see what, what we could learn about them. Um, you know, were there any patterns that would show us if a, badger, if a badger behaves in this particular way, it's likely that she is pregnant. But due to circumstances, then it turned into something quite different, which was looking at the effects of forestry on breeding badgers. So other research, you can see there, Pav um, found that female badgers stay quite close to their set while their cubs are young. So I had looked at that with our badgers and I found that our pregnant females stayed within 300 metres of the set almost all the time. So we, we just used two o'clock in the morning um, so that we wouldn't be um, autocorrelating data. But on average, 80% of the time in February, our female badgers were 300 metres, within 300 metres of the set, if they were pregnant. So you can see that roughly from the graph down below, you don't really need the details, but the blue ones are badgers that later proved to have cubs and you can see how much more of their records are within that 300 metres of the set and the two smaller red columns there are badgers that didn't produce cubs. So this really is the story of one particular badger called Gina 
and there are her total records there. We put a collar on her in October 2011 and sadly she was killed on the, the road then the following May. And you can see the, the range there of her home range. Her set is up here where the X is and a lot of her records are gathered in and around that set. So it's close to the edge of the woodland. And in October 2011, the owners of the woodland put in an application to fell the timber around this. Now, part of my job in the National Parks and Wildlife Service is commenting on felling licenses. So they asked me for comments and they asked for advice. I used the Forestry Commission advice for um, felling close to sets and that was to create an exclusion zone of 20 metres. And they did this by cutting uh, four trees and then taping around it, but they didn't put the tape up until the last minute um, so that badger diggers and people wouldn't actually notice where the set was. And then within that zone over the set, all the felling was done by hand, but they kept the heavy machinery outside of that protected zone and they made sure that they didn't impede any of the badger tracks. Um, and they were to stack all the timber and everything far away from the set. So they were the guidelines and the felling was supposed to happen in October, but it didn't happen in October. And we noticed when we drive by that, you know, the, the trees were still standing there and all seemed to be fine until February when Gina stopped sending us records and we were afraid that she had died or that something had happened to her because we had had some badger digging in that um, set beforehand. So somebody went out to look and what did we discover? But the trees had all been cut down. So felling actually began on the 1st of February in 2012. This was not something that we had expected. They had complied very carefully with the conditions of their license as, as listed there. But of course, those conditions were written for October and not for right smack bang in the middle of the breeding season. Gina actually stayed underground for 11 nights. And then when we caught her again in April, she wasn't lactating. So the real question is, was Gina pregnant? And what I've done here in this graph was I've recorded her level of activity. So she's the green line and I compared it with another badger who was the same age as her, who, um, you know, this is the same, same year, same breeding season. I just compared the pattern of their activity. So you can see that it matches lilies um, very closely there until the end of January. And at that stage, the pattern changes completely. So she's much less active. So that, that involves the 11 nights that she stayed underground. And then after the felling, her activity changes again. So it seems to me that she had the pattern of activity of a pregnant badger in January, but then in February, that was completely different. So. I believe that she was pregnant until the felling and that something happened. So what did actually happen? When we went to have a look, every single entrance to that set had a massive fresh spoil heap outside it. So was there subsidence inside the set due to the heavy machinery, even though it was 20 metres away from the entrances? Was it that the badgers were digging deeper to try and get away maybe from the, you know, the, the, the sound of the machines or the, the shaking and, and activity of the machines? Did this activity cause her to have a stillbirth? Or did she actually kill her own cubs due to stress? And infanticide in stressful situations is known from other animals. Or perhaps because she didn't go out for 11 nights, her milk dried up and her cub starved. We're obviously never going to know the answer to that. But all we do know is that her pattern of behaviour suggests that she was pregnant and then it changed once the, um, once the felling began 
and she was not lactating when we caught her in April, unlike the other badgers of her age group. So that's Gina, and hopefully what we learned from her, we have been using with the Forest Service in Ireland to try and update their recommendations about how to protect areas that have badgers when forestry operations are necessary. What about the roadworks? As I said before, we had three years of data before the road actually began. So we ended up with a really deep knowledge of the different social groups. Uh, we knew the individuals within those groups um, prior to construction. And this is much more than normally would be known about a development site, you know, where they would just have superficial badger surveys beforehand. One of our groups lost 30% of their territory to the road and two other groups were bisected by it. So again, this was really important information that we had. So I used that information with the construction company to influence the location of the underpasses and the fencing. So we got much more fencing put onto this road than is normal in a motorway in Ireland. In over five years now since the road was built, we've only had four badgers killed on it. And even with that, we were able to figure out straight away what had happened and to remediate those actions. So this has really protected badgers in the area. But you'll remember that our research question was to see whether the badgers um, ecology was affected by the roadworks. So we found that after construction, um, there weren't any changes to the social groups or the behaviour. We have some indications of stress during the construction phase. Uh, we haven't analysed that properly yet and we haven't written it up yet, but we did find an increase in bite wounds during that time, which would indicate that the badgers were under a certain amount of stress. So we're glad to have been able to maintain the social groups um, and, and the behaviour of our local badgers. And I suppose most importantly, there wasn't any change in TB status. So we know from humans that stressed humans are more likely to get TB. Yes, we had vaccinated our badgers, but there was no change in that. It wasn't able to override the, the effectiveness of the vaccine. And I think that's a really important thing for us to hold on to, that in stressful situations, the, the vaccine is still protecting the badgers. And there was no change in the TB status of the cattle either. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I'll take any questions that you have. And thank, you know, I'm really grateful for the opportunity again to talk to you tonight. So thank you so much again. So if I hand over to Cheryl initially, because Cheryl's been keeping tabs on a few of the questions. Um, and then, um, and uh, if um, Cheryl can read out some of the questions for you or you know, one at a time, um, perhaps you would be happy to, to answer those questions? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a few. Um, what was the prevalence of BTB in the stud, study badges and how did that compare with areas outside the study area? And what other key things did you find out about the study badges overall health? Right. So I suppose we looked at TB our blood and whatever, and we also, because we had maybe five years of the life of many of those badgers, we would have recaptured them uh, twice a year for that period of time. We were able to look at whether their TB status changed as they went along. So out of the number of badgers that we caught, we only had four badgers that actually had um, TB. It was actually a very low level of TB in those badgers. Um, of the four badgers, with TB um, was shedding it and we were quite nervous about him initially because part of his home range 
was a dairy farm. Um, so we were really, really watching carefully what went on there. And that dairy farm stayed clear the whole time, didn't have any TB reactors. We did have one other farm that had TB reactor. I think actually it had about three TB reactors on it. Um, but the badgers that we had on that farm didn't have TB. So it, it, was, it was quite interesting in, in that way. Now, some of the, the area around it, um, there was one particular farm that had a lot of TB on it. It seemed to be quite endemic on that. But um, it, it, uh, we'd one badger that we euthanized because she, um, she had a wound that didn't heal. And the vets were quite sure that that wound was infected, um, that she had TB, like she was coming back as positive TB on bloods. Um, and the fact that she wasn't healing, um, she was euthanized and her post-mortem found that she actually had very advanced TB. So she would have been shedding TB um, through her urine as well as through breathing, you know, her breath. But the badgers that lived in the set with her, um, came back negative, which we found quite interesting as well. So hopefully that answers some of, of the question there. Hi. And Cheryl, Hi. I've forgotten the second question. <laughs> <laughs> the second question was, um, what are the key things did you find out about the study badges overall health? Okay, so we found out really that they were very healthy. Um, they all had ticks, they all had fleas. Um, we towards the end we did a little thing on on like their worm load for another project that Trinity College were doing. Um, we didn't treat them with wormers. Initially, we were being really scientific and we were saying, you know, we weren't going to, we were just going to leave these badgers live wild and whatever. But after a while, we actually did if start them if they had a very heavy tick load or flea load, particularly if they were cubs or young badgers. Um, we just wanted to give them the best chance in life. So we did actually spray them with frontline um, flea killer. So, but generally to be healthy, we had one badger that we called Granny Mac. I think I mentioned her in the second talk. She was killed on the road when she was about 13. Um, and I suppose like most wildlife, we found past their first birthday, they usually had a good chance of living a, a relatively long life. Um, about 10% of our badgers were killed on the road, which uh, looking at studies from other countries seems to be pretty normal for, for that. Okay, lovely. We, we've got some more coming in. Um, there's, there's two here which are probably closely related. Um, how have you found relations with the farming community throughout the project? And another one asking, um, were the farmers generally amenable to the aims of the project? They're really good questions. And I touch on them in the second talk, but um, it's great to be able to answer them live now. So before we began the project, we went around and knocked on all the doors in the project area. So we the project area was about 48, 50 square kilometres. And um, we asked all the farmers for permission to, to trap on their land. We explained what we were doing. Um, some farmers were kind of indifferent about badgers. There were one or two that really didn't like them. Um, but once we said that we were vaccinating them, they were all very happy with that. Now, around the project area, we had what we call the buffer zone. And as time went on in our project, maybe towards, say, year five or six, in the buffer zone, some of the herds went down with TB. And they'd obviously been talking to the farmers within the study area. So some of them asked if we could actually vaccinate the badgers in the buffer zone as well. Now, there were, um, there were two bad farmers out there who absolutely hated badgers. One of them admitted afterwards, but making sure that the statute of limitations had gone, he admitted to me that he had killed badger cubs. 
Um, but interestingly, after we had worked with him, he became one of our biggest fans and he's very pro the project now and pro the kind of aftermath of the project where the vets go back every year and vaccinate any new badgers that are there. So we got great support from them. And at the end of the project, um, we had a night in a local hostelry for them. We did a pho photographic exhibition. So we'd taken millions of photographs throughout the whole project and we picked the best pictures we picked a picture of every single farm up there and you know an odd one we might have had a farmer holding a badger or something like that so we made sure they were all up and we had cocktail sausages and a few drinks and whatever and gave a few talks and they saw their photographs and we had 70 people came to that so it, it was really well supported brilliant there's um another couple here which are probably kind of related um, how big was Jean's range and how were non-pregnant females activity patterns different from the pregnant female you referenced in the graph with Gina I'm guessing their activity was quite different at that time if you think she was pregnant based on activity pattern alone or were there other factors okay um, off the top of my head I can't say what what size Gina's range was, so I'd have to go and work it out. Um, but if whoever asked that question wants to drop me a line afterwards, I'll have a look at the GIS and I can tell them. The, the non-pregnant females ranged much further. So that was, they, they would have used, say, the whole of their winter range um, during the months of January, February and March, where the pregnant females stayed very close to home in January and February. Um, as time went on, even if they had cubs, they began to move a bit further away. The female badger ranges in the winter were much smaller anyway, whether they were pregnant or not, than their summer range. And depend be a bit of an individual difference in there as well. So we had one badger called Dolly, and the very first year we were sure Dolly was dead because she didn't send us any GPS signal six weeks. But sure, she was with her cubs. Spring came along, and the following year, Dolly did the same thing. But our, you might remember that winter of 2010, uh, 2011, was very cold. There was a lot of ice. We had temperatures down to minus 18 and stuff. Um, so we put it down initially to that. But that actually doesn't seem to have made all the difference, you know. So the, the difference between pregnant and not pregnant was how far they ranged from the set during that time. Okay, and um, were, the, were the collars able to send reliable signals while badges were underground or did they have issues? So what the, the collars were set to, to try and ping once the badger came above ground. If the badger was close to the entrance of the set, they sent a message. But generally speaking, when the badger was deep down underground, no, they didn't. We had it um, for, for part of the project, I wanted to check whether they could send signals from inside farm buildings or not when we were looking at, at the farm stuff. So we, we left a collar inside in a barn and sure enough, it was able to send us a signal from that. And then one that I recovered from a dead badger, um, I left in my shed and caused great consternation to the other members of the team when they thought that somebody had run off with a, one of our badgers and it suddenly appeared up in the middle of the mountains, you know? So, but it was it was the collar pinging from my shed. <laughs> and I fell off and it sent a, a signal. So I think the collars work really, really well on lynxes and on other animals that are not constantly underground. Um, but we got the best of, of what we could from, you know, and they were very reliable in terms of sending uh, data. I think we'd one turned up in Iceland once, but generally speaking, <laughs> they were within 15 metres of where the badger actually was, you know. Um, has there been any change to the advice the council provides regarding tree felling based on your findings, Regina? So the answer to that really is no. We have given advice, but um, 
you probably wouldn't be aware that our forest service in Ireland is in a bit of chaos at the moment um, because they, they hadn't really been doing appropriate assessment correctly on forestry fellings that were connected with SACs. So there's this massive big backlog now and they, they have months and months of waiting lists. So they really haven't got around to dealing with the recommendations that we sent to them. I do believe that they will look at them. They probably won't take them on board exactly as we recommended because um, I was saying a 50 meter buffer zone instead of 20 and that there shouldn't really be any felling in forest coops that had bad sets during the three months of the breeding season. But I know the response to that is going to be, well, you won't let us do this during the badger season. And then you have the bird nesting season. So when can we actually cut trees, you know? So there probably will have to be a certain amount of, um, of compromise on that. But I think a wide zone of probably 150 metres around a set, if it has to happen during that time of year. Brilliant. Um, is the lack of preventative action on our roads, fencing, underpasses, etc., the main reason for so many badger casualties on the road? Is it simply a lack of funding or interest stopping these actions being carried out, do you think? I think there's a mixture of things in that. So there's, um, there's a funding issue because definitely it cost an awful lot more to put in the extra fencing that I wanted on that road. Um, but they did do it. But obviously the taxpayer has suffered for that. Um, there's also a kind of a sense that underpasses are put in where it suits the engineers more than where the badgers necessarily need them to be. And because, um, because in most badger surveys for roadworks and so on, um, they haven't got the amount of data that we had. So we thought we'd have six months data, but we three years data prior to the road and the road was a design and build scheme. So I was able to influence where the, the underpasses went. In fact, we were able to tell them to take out some underpasses that they'd planned um, because they weren't necessary. But in most road schemes, they don't look at where the social group boundaries are. So my priority was to keep social groups intact. Um, you know, and we didn't need badgers to be able to go from one social group to the other social group across the road, but we did need badgers to be able to go from part of their home range to the rest of their home range under the road, you know, so that, that it kept, kept the ranges intact. And generally speaking, that knowledge is not there. Um, so I'd love a more cost effective way of being able to find out that. Um, I think that would improve things. So that's, that's kind of for new roads. But for the old roads, I think the main problem was is speed. So I think people driving very fast along roads, not paying attention to what's there. And in my experience, badgers that are on the road um, don't just jump into the ditch if a car is coming. They carry on along the road waiting to find their badger path before they hop into the ditch. And I think that causes a lot of accidents with them. That's just anecdotal. That's just me thinking. Um, and a, cu a couple sort of probably more related to behaviour. It said, um, you said the collars would ping inside the farm buildings. Did you find badgers visiting farm buildings in your study? And if so, was this a large proportion? And another question, um, why does biting activity increase with more stress on the badgers? So I might leave the one about farm buildings until the second talk because I deal with badgers and farms a good bit in that. And if the person who asked it wants to ask it again at the end of that talk, I think it will make more sense. Um, sorry, um, Cheryl, just tell me yeah, a second um, again there. What? Why does biting activity increase with more stress on the badgers? I have no idea is the answer to that. But what we found with our badgers um, was that we had a lot less biting than was recorded from the UK. So we were using Roper's book um, and the, the studies that are mentioned in that for the levels of um, 
biting. And we definitely found a lot less. We think that that might be to do with the density of badgers. We had what we call a medium density. So we had somewhere between 1.3 and 1.8 badgers per kilometer square. Whereas a lot of the studies are done in Whitham Wood and in, in um, sorry, senior moment, you know, the, the other famous badger place um, where the density. Are, thank you, thank you. Where the, the densities are up to like 44 badgers per kilometer square. So I think there's there's quite a difference um, in that. So that may be the reason that we had a lot less uh, biting. But I do think that particularly with the males, we saw a spike in the spring when the vegetation was cleared at, at the beginning of the road construction. We saw a, um, a spike in bites at that stage compared with other springs and the rest of the, the study period. But we have to sit down properly with those and I'm not really the mathematician. So we have somebody who's a statistics expert on the team and he'll get to crunch those numbers. So whatever I say now about the numbers would be wrong, so I won't say anything. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> at the end of the study, do you know the TB status of the four badges that had TB at the start of the study? I, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that, Cheryl, because my internet just oh, cracked right. there. At, at the end of the study, do you know the TB status of the four badges that had TB at the start of the study? Yeah. So all those four badgers are dead, sadly. Um, three of them, three, uh, sorry, two were killed on the road. One was the badger we euthanized because of her wound. And the fourth badger had suspected uh, T we, we put down a second badger that we suspected had TB um, because we were using this mobile test for him, um, which showed him up as having TB. Um, but in, afterwards, when he had his post-mortem and his final buds, that badger hadn't got TB. So that's we after that, we said we're not euthanizing any more badgers. There is still one badger going around who tested positive. Um, she never tested positive from her pharyngeal swabs, which meant that she wasn't actually shedding it. She had it, but she obviously had it walled up someplace inside of herself. Um, so she wasn't actually a spreader. So she's still walking around and hopefully will live a long, happy life and not cause any problems for anybody else. Lovely. Um, that, that's all that we had on chat, but I know Vanessa had one for you as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, the one question that I had, um, you mentioned that obviously no culling uh, took place within your 48 to 50 square kilometer uh, study area um, and that badge vaccination is continuing. Um, is, have you found or is there any data to suggest that the uh, prevalence in the badgers in the study area have a lower a lower prevalence than badgers outside the study area. I don't know how much testing has been done on on badgers in um, in Ireland in terms of the TB prevalence. What was done um, in terms of testing was a kind of general testing. So. The Department of Agriculture uh, kill about 8,000, somewhere between 6,000 and 8,000 badgers a year in terms of cull, which I know is a lot less than in the UK, but just think of the land size is a lot less as well. Mm. And um, initially, uh, well, it's still on their license that they receive from the National Parks and Wildlife Service, they're supposed to test the badgers. So they have said that they've done enough testing to know that the prevalence rate in badgers ranges between 13% and 25%. Now, it was obviously much lower in our study area. So you'll sometimes hear the Department of Agriculture quoting one or other of those two figures, 13 or 25%. Mm. Now, I'm not up to date. They, perhaps that has moved on a little bit since. So they don't routinely test 
the badgers. It is expensive to do the post-mortem on a badger. It's about 70 euro per badger. We uh, had an agreement with them that any dead badgers either found on our area or part of our project when they died, uh, we're going to get a post-mortem. So we got proper post-mortem results from all of the badgers and they, they were very good for doing that for us. So they, they, they're they the kind of generally conceived, um, uh, what would you say, numbers. But you saw there, we captured about 140 badgers and we had four badgers that had TB. So we reckoned that that was the rate in our area. Outside of our area study area, Things I think were pretty much the same in that part of Wicklow. But I have seen maps, which Wicklow is considered one of the black spots for uh, bovine TB in Ireland. And um, when you look at the maps year on year, what happens seems to be that the outbreaks of TB in the county move around in a circular kind of a pattern. So say the northeast of the county is really bad one year and then it's the east, then it's the southeast, the south and so on, moving around the county. I don't know what's causing that yeah. or why there seems to be this pattern of movement of TB. But I've also seen it in maps for other counties. Um, last year there was, I think, major breakdown up in County Monaghan and uh, it started in the northwest of the county and kind of moved in a southeast direction across the county. And they had a vaccination um, area in the centre of that county uh, done by the Department of Agriculture. But the, the TB outbreak moved right through that vaccination area as well. And it, it just seemed to spread that way. Hmm. Uh, perhaps we're learning a lot more about infectious diseases through having COVID, um, you know, that that after all TB is spread in basically the same way as COVID yeah. is spread, you know, so. Um, okay, thanks very much, um, Enda. So in this talk, I'd like to focus on the relationship between badgers, farms and TB. The topic of badgers and farms is a hot one and has been for many years. The reason being, of course, that badgers are implicated in the cycle of bovine TB. 99% of the farmers that I meet love wildlife and they're very happy to have wild animals on their farms. But generally, cattle farmers are wary of badgers because of this connection with TB. So we know that TB is a very infectious respiratory disease and in humans it's associated with poverty and with overcrowding. But thankfully, there's a vaccine for it for us. In animals, it can also be associated with things like poor husbandry. That's not always the case, and generally in modern cattle farms, that's not what spreads it. It's spread by droplets. So close contact between an infected animal and another animal is what causes TB to spread. At the moment in the human population, we are dealing with another highly infectious respiratory disease. And probably for the first time in history, the general population know more about its infections and how to control them. So we're going to use the methods of controlling COVID-19 to have a look at our uh, infectious respiratory disease under discussion today. So to have a look at TB and to see if the methods that we're using to try and control COVID work with regard to bovine TB. So we're all aware of these. We're told to maintain social distance, so we have to stay two metres apart. We're to limit our house parties so we can't interact outside of our own social group. We have to restrict our movements. At the moment here in Ireland, we have to stay within five kilometres of where we live. Wearing a mask can help and we're constantly being reminded to wash our hands. We're going to use that now to see how badgers, TB and farms interact. The first way to beat the disease is to maintain social distance. 
So people used to believe that badgers spread TB to cattle by coming very close to them in fields. And we can ask that question, do they? So in our project, we used to have a website and every night the movements of the badgers were recorded on that website. And we gave the link to the farmers in the project so that they could check out what their own badgers were doing each night. This particular picture here is a picture of three months data, um, three different badgers and the outline of the farm there is, is in red. You can see where their set is and there was a latrine here where badgers from the two neighbouring social groups met. So the blue badger came from a social group that was off in this direction, including the quarry, and the orange and green badgers were from this particular set down here. So the farmer of this farm used to watch his badgers each night. And one morning he remarked to me that he noticed that the badgers were never in the same paddock as his cattle. Well, I got so excited to hear that because back in 1989, Benham and Broome said that badgers avoided cattle. But their study used mostly artificial settings and their study was quite short. So we asked this farmer if he would keep a record of where his cattle were over a three month period. And then we matched that up against the badger movements across his 19 paddocks for that three months. I then divided the GPS hits from our badgers into times when the cattle were absent from the paddocks, but the badgers were present, and into times when the badgers were in the paddocks along with the cattle. So you can see that clearly on the maps here. There's a lot of hits here when the cattle were absent, and there's a lot less when the badgers were foraging with cattle present. But this picture B here is not even all as it seems. Most of the fixes here in these two paddocks kind of surprised me and I spoke to the farmer about it and he said that he forgot to tell me that he had divided those paddocks in half for his weanlings. So I checked the dates against the records again and the badger, badgers were actually using the empty halves of the paddocks when the calves were in them. So this was statistically significant. And what it says really to us is that badgers were keeping their social distance away from cattle. They were not close enough to the cattle to spread TB directly through droplets. They were actually avoiding contact with them. Around the same time that I was writing up the results of that study, Declan O'Mahony was doing research in Northern Ireland using proximity collars. So he put collars on both badgers and cattle for five months. And these collars recorded any time they came within two metres of each other. Does that two metres sound familiar? His proximity collars resulted in more than 376,000 interactions where two colours met one another within two metres. Over a quarter of a million of these were between one bovine and another bovine. The rest were between one badger and another badger. Not one was between a badger and a cow. So at no point during those five months did a coloured cow and a coloured badger come within two metres of each other. The badgers and the cows were too far away from one another to spread the disease by droplets. So our research and Declan's scotched the theory of badgers being a risk to cattle by coughing on them in fields. And since that, some research in the UK has shown similar results. I think Rosie Woodruff may have been studying um, very close to, to where you are and had similar findings. The second way that we control COVID is to limit the number of guests to our homes. So when the direct passing of the TB bacillus from badger to cattle in fields was proved to be unlikely, people said it must actually be happening then in farmyards and in feeding lots. So we all know that badgers are sometimes seen in farmyards 
in one Irish radio tracking study under Dr. Paddy Sleeman in Cork, they followed a badger into a milking parlour. And at the very start of our study, we found one that was living in a shed. The title picture for this talk shows one of our badgers called Finn in a cattle shed. So the question really was, how much do badgers actually use farmyards? And do they use them often enough to pose a TB risk to the cattle? So we looked at this over three years using 40 badgers with collars. They were from 12 different social groups and most of those groups had more than one badger wearing a collar. Roughly half and half of our badgers were male and female. And we had 58 farmyards within the ranges of those 40 badgers. So they had plenty of opportunity to visit a farmyard. When we totted up the records, we had almost 31,000 GPS fixes from those three years. But only 66 of those fixes, which is 0.21%, were actually within the farmyards. Now, you might be thinking that farmyards occupy very little space compared to a whole farm, and you're right. So we worked out the area of the farmyards as a proportion of the badger's home range. So say, for example, the farmyard took up 1% of the badger's home range. Well, then we'd expect that 1% of that badger's GPS fixes might come from within the farmyard. That's if they were using the farmyards randomly. We'd expect more than that to come from the farmyard if the badgers were actually choosing to be there or being drawn into them. But what we discovered was that the fixes were way below the expected amount of use that should be. And this was significant when we looked at the statistics. So we can therefore say that the badgers were actually avoiding coming into farmyards. Some studies in England found that the season influenced whether badgers visited farmyards and when they visited. They found that there were more visits in summer or spring, but we found no difference at all with the seasons. Maybe this is because Ireland is wetter than England. Garnet had found that his badgers visited during dry spells and he wondered if that was because there were less worms available. Now we know that Ireland is damper and we also know that Irish badgers eat less earthworms or they're less reliant on them. But we actually had no difference during dry weather. You can see there this red arrow, <clears throat> that's the, the driest weather and the most likely to be in a farmyard, but it's still below um, the statistical line that would show that they were being drawn into the farmyards. Some of those English studies also found gender differences in the visits to farmyards and buildings, but we didn't. We did, however, find that there seemed to be an element of personal preference amongst the badgers. So Violet, one of our badgers, really loved visiting a particular stable yard in her area. I think she made 18 visits to that yard. And we're pretty sure that she was feeding in the mucked out dung, which was probably really rich in earthworms. In Northern Ireland, then, Declan O'Mahony used a different method to look at this. So his team blitzed all their farmyards with trail cameras. And they also had very few badger visits out of thousands of nights of film. And again, when they looked at it closely, it was a particular badger that carried out most of the visits. So we can say that badgers are not really visiting farmyards in the way that we might expect them to be. So that the risk of TB being spread by badgers in farmyards through direct contact is very limited. Earlier in the talk, I said that we had 12 social groups. So we wanted to test whether the badgers picked up the habit of visiting farmyards from other members of their social group. And we looked at those groups where there were more than one badger collar 
or coloured badger, <laughs> excuse me. We found that social group had absolutely no effect. So this picture here sums it all up. Over the three years, only two badgers visited this farmyard, which was a total of five visits, despite all the opportunity that you can see around it to visit. And this particular farmyard never had cattle in it. It was actually just used for storage. So any badger that visited it would have been undisturbed while they were there. So we can sum up this section about farmyard visits by saying that badgers avoided them and that any visits which did occur were not influenced by season, by rainfall, by gender or by social group. We think that they were simply opportunistic. When I started to examine badgers use of farmyards, I didn't realise that all the previous work had been restricted to cattle farms only. I just set out and looked at all the 58 farms in our study area. So these were mostly cattle, but there were also horses, sheep and tillage, and then various mixtures of those. We had several disused farmyards, I think it might have been six. These would be cases where the farmer had two farms, but he only used one of the yards. So examining all those different types of farms threw up a really interesting picture. Badgers were unlikely to visit any farmyard, but if they did, it was mostly most likely to be a stud farm. The second most likely farmyard was the disused one. So often these would have been mossed over and there were plenty of beetles for them to catch and they would be undisturbed while they were there. The third most likely farm to be visited was sheep farm. And we know that most sheep farmers will keep a supply of nuts in their farmyards. So one morning I noticed that a badger called Beach had visited a farmyard during the night and I spoke to the farmer. And he laughed and he said that he had spilled sheep nuts the day before and he hadn't swept them up. And that was the only visit to that farmyard in three years. Of all our 10 categories of farm, the one that was least likely to be visited was a cattle yard, even though we had more cattle farms than any other. So, we can say that badgers avoid all farmyards and they avoid cattle yards most of all. If our badgers were humans then, they were following COVID restrictions, we could say that they have indeed limited their visits to other prem. But now we can ask the question, are badgers actually restricting their movements? I mean, almost every farmer that I've spoken to would like to keep his own healthy population of badgers rather than run the risk of outside badgers coming in that might bring TB with them. And this is why some farmers in Ireland refuse to allow the Department of Agriculture to cull badgers on their land. So does a farmer have a group of badgers or does a badger have a group of farms? We found that our badgers had big home ranges. The summer ranges were bigger than the winter ones. I've mentioned that before. And as you can see from this slide, our male average was 175 hectares in the summer, while the females were 130. But there was obviously variation amongst that. The biggest male home range was over 700 hectares and the biggest female was about half of that. And I'll come back to that later on. So in this picture, you can see a month's movements for a female badger called Ivy. And her set is the red dot up here in the picture. And that photo shows about four or five kilometers of a distance between her furthest fixes. So she traveled quite a bit. The average farm in our study area was 33 hectares. So if we remember the size of those badger home ranges, we can see that each badger has a number of farms within their range. 
So in the summer, we reckoned that the males had about five farms and the females four farms amongst their home ranges. So obviously what happens on one farm can really affect others. And if we have a badger that's shedding TB, then there's the potential for infecting animals on up to five farms. Now, you'll remember from two slides ago that I said we had one male badger with a summer home range of 733 hectares. In fact, we had a number of male badgers that were like them. And these badgers originally had a normal range within the boundary of their social group territory. But then for some reason, they included the territory of the social group next door as well. So in this picture here, we see the home range of a badger called Billy. And that area there is basically the same as the home range of the rest of the social group. But then Billy expanded it and he included all of the next door social groups area as well as his own. The other badgers in both of these social groups kept to their normal boundaries, but Billy spanned both. We called Billy and the other males that were like him, super rangers. So during the course of our study, we had 12 super rangers who maintained these large double territories for a long time, several years even in some cases. From our experience, we believe that badgers became super rangers when something happened to the adult male in the next social group. Because these were all adult badgers, as you can see, they were over three years of age themselves. Now, understanding the role of super rangers is important for any decisions regarding the removal of badgers from farms. And there are disease implications that follow such decisions. So if you take an adult male badger, which is possibly what happened here from this social group, we believe that it's likely that the adult male from the neighbouring social group will incorporate that into his area until another adult male badger appears in that first group. So after normal home ranges and super rangers, there's a third type of badger movement which is relevant for farms. Um, this is dispersal movement. So lots of other researchers have looked at dispersal, but the studies have often been in areas where there's very high density of badgers. And they found that male badgers tend to move into the group next door, while females dispersed one group further away. And we found the exact same pattern. What our colours showed us though, is that nothing with badgers is as simple as it seems. So this is the example of Tiffin. It's Evan's favourite badger was Tiffin. And Tiffin was born in this red square. You can see all these little dots here, are their various movements of, that Tiffin made. And each of these squares is based on our main sets being an average of 1.3 kilometres away from one another which is what it was in the study area. So Tiffin was born in the red square and eventually dispersed to the green square, two social groups away. That's typical for females. However, she was wearing a collar when this dispersal took place. So we were able to track the journey that she went in the process. She actually traveled a journey of 66 kilometers before settling down just over two kilometers away from her birthplace. So all these dots represent movements that Tiffin made before she ended up, as we say, back next door. In the process of that journey, she went through the territories of an estimated 24 other social groups. Now Tiffin is just one example. All of our dispersing badgers had a similar movement pattern though some of them were shorter. One other female called Olivia gets the prize, however. Her journey through, 20, through two social groups took her a whopping 308 kilometres. Now you can see how important this is. In the process of those journeys, 
these badgers must be meeting other badgers in all the social groups that they visit. The potential to become infected or to spread infection is obviously enormous. And that's why vaccination is so crucial, is to protect these badgers themselves and to protect any other farms that they cross in the process of dispersal. Using our COVID analogy, we can say that the badgers have failed miserably on the restrict your movements aspect of disease reduction. So it's obviously crucial then to prevent them from catching it in the first place. The best time to do this, we believe from our work is before they are one year old. So I mentioned before that previous research on dispersal was done in areas of very high density of badgers. And those badgers often didn't have a chance to disperse until they were adults. In the medium density area that we worked in, we found that some of our badgers dispersed as yearlings and most of them before they were two years old. So we reckon that they need to be vaccinated before they embark on these long journeys. Our farmers were extremely happy to know that all our project badgers were vaccinated. And even though the project is finished, vaccination still occurs in the area each year um, where the vets go back to get any new badgers that are there or any that have been born since the previous year. This approach to vaccination in our study area is different to the rest of Ireland at the moment. The normal Department of Agriculture procedure is to go in and call first and then vaccinate any badgers that are left after that. We didn't call. We simply vaccinated every badger that we caught and we gave a full dose of BCG to them. And we believe that these badgers are now protected for life. And you can see from the movement data that I've shared with you how important it is to get that vaccination. If one goes in and culls first, all we're creating is a movement. Um, so, and we're, we're vaccinating very few badgers then compared with being able to vaccinate a whole population. Now, with all forms of infectious disease, you can never be too careful. So bio, uh, biosecurity on farms is crucial. And biodiversity is too. But biosecurity is what we're talking about here. So we were very, very careful about disinfecting our vehicles and ourselves when we were moving from one farm to another in case we brought anything with us. And our farmers really appreciated this. But there's a lot that farmers can do themselves. Okay? So this picture was taken from a trail camera that we put up in a particular farm shed because we suspected that Finn, this really elderly badger, was visiting uh, the farmyard. And the camera caught him taking a shortcut through a shed. Although it looks like he's ensconced there in that spot, he never actually stopped and he never fed. He literally just kept moving. But the same camera caught a whole host of other animals in that shed. During the day, there were magpies and crows in foraging in the silage. Loose cattle wandered through and had a bite to eat. And there were rabbits. And on one occasion, there was even a deer in there. Every single night, the farm collie slept in this silage. And Finn only took one shortcut across it once. So there's a whole body of work, as you know, from England on biosecurity on farmyards and, and farm buildings. And it shows that despite the best intentions in the world, human beings are inconsistent and mistakes happen. But biosecurity is extremely important and it needs to be taken very seriously. We know that badgers can carry TB. We also know most recently from CRISPR's work that they're able to give it to cattle. No one has ever figured out how that happens. And, you know, especially now when we know that the chances of badgers and cattle coming close enough to infect one another is very slim. So the only thing that's left is that it has to be through infected objects which are sniffed by the cattle. 
on our cameras in fields, we've seen cattle and deer with their faces down badger set sniffing. We've also witnessed cattle rolling on the dry soil in the badger spoil heaps. So our advice to farmers is to fence off sets and latrines from cattle so that they simply can't sniff them. It's a really simple thing to do, but it could make a very big difference. Our project encompassed about 60 farms and all of our farmers were supportive and interested. Many of them were actually glad to play a part in finding out more about the animals that lived on their farms. And they were all particularly appreciative of the fact that we vaccinated the badgers in the study area. The dairy farmer that this photograph was taken on his farm, he checked the traps for us every single morning for the seven years of our field work. None of the farmers wanted to see harm done to the, to the badgers. They just wanted to know that they had healthy badgers on their land. So we owe them a great debt for all that they contributed to the research. And I think what we owe to all farmers really is to know that there are healthy badgers on farms today. I'm going to leave you now with a summary. So we can say that badgers avoid cattle on farms, either in the fields or in the sheds. They generally travel across a large number of farms, especially when they're dispersing or if they have become super rangers. And for this reason, it's vital to vaccinate badgers and in our opinion, to do so before they're a year old. Farmers themselves need to take biosecurity seriously and need to especially keep cattle away from sets and latrines. So I'd like to say a huge thanks to our farmers from the Badger team. And I especially would like to thank all of you for inviting me here today and for listening to me. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. The badgers, when, when they were dispersing, and there's probably two that tie up here, um, do you, did you have any idea why they went such a long way just to finish up back where they started from? And is there any evidence to show that badgers are fully protected after just one vaccine? So uh, we have no idea why they did those big journeys, whether they were looking for other places, to, you know, that if, if some other area was suitable, they might have settled in. We did have one female badger that seemed to actually um, settle down quite a distance away from, about 18 kilometres away from her natal area, but she seemed to be unusual. We were just really lucky that we had so many badgers who had collars on them when they happened to disperse. We weren't actually trying to study that. It was, it, it was just something that happened. So then we looked at, at what happened at that point. Um, and I've talked myself to a standstill now, Cheryl, again. What was the second part of that? Is there any evidence to show that badges are fully protected after just one vaccine? So um, what we found was that our badgers who only got one vaccine, uh, some of them lived for quite a long time. So we had badgers, we'd say some of them were seven or eight when they died. Granny Mac was about 13. Finn was pretty old as well. So they all um, had got to that stage without getting TB. But I know that uh, some of the veterinary uh, section of the Department of Agriculture is advising giving a top up. So when the vets are going back to our study area now every year, if they catch one of our badgers who's been vaccinated about four years ago, they're giving them a top up of the vaccine. But it's probably just as, as we say in Ireland, to be sure, to be sure, you know, <laughs> so to make sure that things are working that way. Um, another one, how, how long does TB stay in the badger's urine and faeces? Um, so this isn't part of our study, but I have read studies on this, that um, the TB bacillus can live in damp soil for up to about two years, somewhere 18 months to two years. And that in, um, if it's out in sunlight, it's about a fortnight, perhaps, some, something around that, uh, 
the sun's very bright, it might be two or three days. If it's if it's darker, it might be up to a fortnight. I read that. I I'm not being very specific about it because it's just something I've I've read and I can't remember the details of it. Um, but soil helps. That's that if if that's damp soil that's take you know dug out from inside of a set, perhaps that soil could be infected. Um, so th there are previous studies that were done. There's also something that I heard at a talk in the UK and I can't unfortunately remember which researcher it was, um, who is, was looking at when um, cow pats are ripe for badgers to come and, and uh, forage in. And that would seem to be between 19 and 21 days so that the, the grubs and things have, have um, want to make it worth foraging. And that unfortunately, of the modern rotations of cattle in pastures are about three weeks. So the badgers are not actually attacking the cow pats until just before the cattle are being put back into the fields again. So it does mean that if you have a badger latrine or badger urine in that field, it's still very fresh by the time the cattle are put back in. So there was somebody in Wales who was looking at extending the rotation of um, grazing. Um, I, and I haven't heard since um, whether, you know, whether he's got any results out of that. But he was trying to make, I think, a six week rotation, which would have allowed the badgers to come in, clean up the cow pats, and still any infection that the badger might have left behind should have surely been killed by the rays of the sun in the meantime before the cattle came back in. But if you have any researchers in your group, there's a challenge for you. I'm throwing down the gauntlet. <laughs> and um, do, do you think that any of the farmers outside of the study area have heard about the research and possibility of free badge vaccination and are they keen to participate? If so, is the study area to be increased? Right. So um, we probably can't increase our study area as it was because our team were very much, um, you know, we had to kind of fight for our time from our day jobs, as it were, to, to do the work. And our bosses were quite good and we did a lot of persuading to let them help, you know, carry on the study for as long as we did. But yes, the, the one of the farmers in the group was actually the local leader of the Irish Farmers Association um, for part of the period that we were there. So he was quite influential in some ways in that, you know, a lot of farmers would have been talking to him and he was actually he was very supportive. Um, he let us keep our, our cages in his shed and things, you know, without any concern that we might be spreading TB to him. Now we did, vac you know, disinfect all the time and all that too. So he was quite supportive. So I think he probably helped spread the word. The, um, the farmers that were outside on the edge of the study area, they really wanted us to come and vaccinate their badgers as well. So as word kind of spread amongst their neighbours, they wanted us um, onto their land as well. So um, since the project finished, there was a breakdown in an adjacent area. And um, the vet is the same vet that was on the project, Teresa. She, she went in and what they did was quite different to what the normal um, Department of Agriculture response is. So they they trapped the badgers, they, they culled the badgers on the specific farm that had broken down. But before they did that, they went and they vaccinated all the badgers in a two kilometer radius around them. So that when they then culled the badgers on the infected farm and, and they were infected because she post-mortemed them, it meant that any movement into that farm was going to be from a vaccinated badger. Um, and the farmers were very, very grateful for that. And that was something that they, they really wanted to know that badgers moving into their farm were actually safe badgers to have there. 
the way the Department of Agriculture works in Ireland is if they if a farm goes down with TB, they put a two kilometer ring around that farm. And if they have an out farm as well, the two, there's another two kilometer ring around that farm. And a lot of Irish farms would be very fragmented. So you could have five, six, um, two kilometer rings from one breakdown. And they go and they call all the badgers in those areas. But they revisit those areas the following year and the year after that again, and the year after that again. So there are some places that have actually been called for 10 years in a row, even though there has been no breakdown in that area. So, um, but that's, that's the policy that they employ there. So I think what we're trying to do is do something similar in one way, but that instead of calling, it's vaccinating on a long-term basis. Um, and, and you know, we have a little bit of a rock to roll up a hill, I suppose, to, to kind of prove that this is just as effective in the area. But it, so far, it definitely seems to be. There's a very interesting question here, actually. Um, and it, it relates really to urban badgers. But is there any evidence that um, urban badgers, if they're living close to the edge of a town or city and crossing into farmland, could they be bringing TB inwards? Presumably into the, the um, city like as well. Presumably, yeah. Uh, I suppose that is possible. Um, I think one of the things that needs to be looked at, um, like I always dread mentioning another animal uh, with regard to TB, but we have found that in some places, feral cats use badger sets as well. I don't know if that's something that you have come across. Um, and we have found that a cat or maybe more cats have actually tested positive for bovine TB as well. So in one case, it was a farm cat um, that lived in the house. So she wasn't a barn cat um, and she tested positive and one member of that family went down with bovine TB, so not human TB. So it's it's just something I suppose that we do need to be mindful of. So um, that badgers can actually, like in that case, it was very much uh, from the badger set that that cat had, had got it, you know? So um, there's always that possibility. So therefore we need to get more badgers vaccinated faster. Yeah. And um, this is probably just more um, your personal feelings. What do you think about the public feeding badgers? Oh, you must have been um, bugging our internet there recently. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, yeah, somebody asked me advice recently on a badger that was regularly coming in through a cat flap into a house and they had a photograph up on social media of the badger sitting in the cat bed with two slices of bread beside it. Um, I don't encourage it. I, I really don't. Um, we love to see wild animals and I know people who are photographers love to feed peanuts and jam and things so that they'll get beautiful photographs. I think wild animals need to stay wild and have a little bit of fear of human beings and, and this is my personal opinion on it um i think animals that become habituated to humans end up getting themselves into trouble um and at some point somebody says that animal's a danger and it needs to be put down or it, it's more likely to be you know, not run away from a farm animal or find it, you know, at the wrong end of some badger jiggers or something like that. So personally, I'd be inclined not to, to feed or not to encourage animals to become too tame, really. Yeah. And the, and the but then I work for the wildlife service. The, the final one is, will the results of this amazing study be available to read at some point? 
So we have published some uh, scientific papers and anybody who wants them can also, you know, we can send them on. Um, we've also written a few uh, kind of, I suppose, write-ups about it that are not quite so scientific because like, you know, scientific papers would melt your head and even writing them would melt your head. So um, we, we have some things that we wrote for Mammal News. We Offer. So if people want, we can share some of those things. Um, that's, that's, there's... Yeah, that, that's great. Um, and uh, and um, I think if anybody is interested, uh, you know, Enda has said that if anybody thinks of a question afterwards that they wish they would have asked, that she's very happy for me to either pass the, the questions on to her or to share her email address. So um, I, I think it would be great, Enda, if you're able to share some links to some of the publications that, that uh, you talk about in terms of your research, because I think um, a lot of people would be very interested in, in reading uh, those. Um, I think um, we've probably got to the stage now where we've um, asked Enda to, to give up quite a lot of her time, which we're really, really grateful for. Um, I think I can probably speak on behalf of everybody who's been on this um, event this evening um, and looking by the fact that the vast majority of the participants are still with us and haven't left shows the degree of interest in your talks, um, Enda, um, and to your questions. Um, I want to thank you so much for giving up your time and sharing your valuable knowledge with us. Um, it's been a pleasure having you and, um, you know, fantastic that you've been able to share, um, you know, all the things that you know about Irish badgers with us. Well, look, thank you so much for inviting me. It, it has really been a pleasure to, to be able to talk to you. Um, I look forward to the day that I can take a plane and come and meet you on site and have a look at some of your badgers. Um, and, you know, it, it's really been a wonderful experience to communicate with you and to, to hear so much as well from you. And Vanessa, thank you so much for all the work that you put into organising it. Um, yeah, and hopefully we will meet in real life at some yeah, point, I suppose. I look forward to that very much.